But if you want to look for the genesis of cryptocurrency, uh, it was the cypherpunk movement, you know, growing out of a kind of a love of the internet and its possibilities, the discovery of cryptography and, and imagining that you could actually uh, give birth to a new world, really, uh, out of the internet. Um, that a world that lives outside of the nation state and outside the structures of power and the hierarchies that are associated with that. These people had talked about the need and the possibility for a digital currency that was anonymous or could be anonymized using cryptography. The cypherpunks that emerged in the early 90s were hyper concerned about privacy, about personal liberty, and a lot of people had come up with their own systems. Some of them came very close to happening. The one that probably came the closest was DigiCash from David Chaum. Privacy of payments is actually essential for democracy. The reason is not because you need to be able to make private payments in order to express yourself, but rather that in order to inform yourself, you may need to purchase information, and that's the thing that allows you to have opinions uh, worth expressing. Although I wouldn't say David Chom was a cypherpunk, he definitely inspired the cypherpunk movement. It's as if the cypherpunks kind of came upon David Chom's tools, like the technology of some alien species, and they only took the weapons. They were most interested in the ones that could be used to disempower the government and empower individuals. The break between him and the cypherpunks came when he realized he would need existing institutions to help him with it. So he started talking to governments, he started talking to banks. He was very close to having this thing happen in the late 90s, and nobody was really prepared for this outside of the cypherpunk movement. People seemed like had almost sort of given up on the project. Other than a few experiments here and there by Hal Finney, uh, Nick Zabo, the conversation around this really died down. And then all of a sudden it came back to life after the financial crisis. And you had people going back to those experiments in the 1990s and looking at new ways of putting those ideas together. Uh, Nick Zabo in 2006 had just finished up a midlife stint at law school. And if you look at Nick's writing around the financial crisis, that it really revived his interest in these ideas that you know he'd been working on in the 1990s with privacy and contracts and the problems of governments and other trusted third parties. And he brought Bitgold back into the conversation. So Hal Finney came up with his own system. Adam Back has hash cash. Wei Dai has B-Money. Zabo has Bitgold. So what Satoshi did in 2008 was Satoshi took a lot of these ideas and made them work and created an encryption-based protocol, it's not really a currency, utilizing a ledger called the blockchain, allowing for many kinds of transactions to occur, contracts, all kinds of things can be built into the blockchain. And it does this through a system of consensus building where multiple computers all participate in the, the management of the blockchain ledger, the kind of digital document, if you will, that keeps track of all the payments. You can have the money supply controlled by a computer. That's all Bitcoin really is. The key point here is that this is a distributed ledger. There is no central server. All the other ledgers that we have, all banking ledgers, all company ledgers, they all sit and reside inside that company, which means they have one point of attack. They can be hacked. JP Morgan was, was hacked by you know, cyber thieves not so long ago. Home Depot, Target, we've had all these companies get hacked precisely because there's one central repository of information. The Bitcoin ledger resides on you know, thousands of computers. It, you can't hack that. Every single transaction is recorded, and once it is recorded in the blockchain, it is there, it is permanent. It cannot be altered, it cannot be changed, so that you can read it. Now, the identities of the people are encrypted, the wallets are encrypted, so you don't know who is spending the money, but you know that every single Bitcoin out there has a history, you know where it's been, you know the different addresses it's gone between. The most important pieces of the Bitcoin infrastructure are the miners. These are the computers that are tasked with maintaining the ledger of the blockchain to verify the information, to update it, to, to make sure that this is trustworthy. So how do we incentivize them to do so? As they are going through the process of confirming transactions, they are simultaneously being subjected to a very, very difficult computing test. The Bitcoin core protocol is, is forcing them to look for a number. 
All of these miners are ultimately competing to be the one that receives that payout every 10 minutes. But really that's the secondary component. They're really being rewarded with Bitcoin for what is the more important task, and that is the validation and verification of transactions and the maintaining of the ledger. Bitcoin, in being the first to achieve this holy grail of decentralized value exchange that transfers that process of trust to a collective agreement around a body of independent computers who are compelled by an incentive system to maintain that consensus and, and firm the information to be correct is incredibly liberating because it means that we can do it without all these intermediaries in all these different realms. The most important thing behind Bitcoin is not the currency. The key factor is the blockchain. Nobody expected this. You know, in 2008, you know, very few people cared about it. It was just the computer scientists and the sort of code geeks that were really interested in it.